Protestants should become Orthodox. But first, I'm going to tell you what I like about Protestants. Generally, they're nice people. They really do love Jesus. They have good works. They have read and know their Bible. They know a lot of verses, and they really do want to spread the gospel. But the thing is, they're nice Catholics, Muslims, Buddhists. We are talking about doctrinal truth. And the fundamental problems with the Protestant position is how do you determine the canon of the Bible? Using the Bible? You know, you have to appeal to something outside like holy tradition and history. The canon of the Bible is dogmatic. Where is that in the Bible? They saw a flaw in the innovations in the Catholic Church. And they should have become orthodox, but instead they tried to reinvent the wheel going on their new path. Instead, they should have walked back on the path and became orthodox. And so the reasons I can't be a Protestant, sola scriptura itself is unbiblical. Most Protestant denominations are not liturgical. They have no priesthood. Very few of the denominations do. They have less or even no sacraments besides baptism. You know, where's the confession? Where's the real presence in the Eucharist? Where's the anointing the sick in most Protestant denominations? It is a denial of Pentecost in Christ's promise, having this invisible church for centuries. You can't have that. There is no continuity with the early church thinking that the church was revived in the 16th century and the endless fracturing since the Reformation. I mean, who is right? You have no basis to judge each other. And if you're a Protestant, there was no biblical canon for centuries. And so where in the Bible does it say what the actual biblical canon is? Because scripture relies on tradition an oral tradition, not the other way around. How do we know the disciple Matthew wrote the book of Matthew? We need oral tradition, not just written, not just by scripture alone. And so the Protestant Reformation and the reformers were correct in seeing that the Catholic Church had added all these innovations to the faith, added all these hats, you know, indulgences, purgatory, papal supremacy, but they were wrong in trying to create their own church. They should have looked at history and walked backwards on the path, but instead they branch off, causing even more endless fracture. This Protestant sums it up. Was Martin Luther's an innovation, or did it look like, was it made to look like an innovation because of the uh, unbelievable amount of incrustation that had happened in the Catholic Church at that time? So when, when you put, you know, and you have the, the church standing there with, with its coat on, and then you put another coat on top of it, and then another coat on top of it, another century, and another coat on top of it, and this would be an analogy for the Catholic Church or the, the Church going through the Middle Ages, and then another coat on top of that, and then a hat on top of the hat on top of the hat, and then Martin Luther comes along, and then he takes all of the extra hats off that everyone had gotten used to looking at for the last several hundred years, and then he takes all the extra coats off that everyone had been getting used to looking at for the last few hundred years, and they're going to say, wow, this is an innovation. This is a totally new thing. It's like, no, it's not. It's the gospel. We didn't move. The Catholic Church moved. Um, the, the evangelical church is the continuity of the ancient church, but without all of the accretions. Now, the Protestant reformers removed too many hats, and in that, they deny what happened at Pentecost, you know, thinking that the church had a blackout for like centuries or up to a thousand years, having this invisible church. I mean, what happened between Pentecost and the 16th century? Jesus is very clear. The gates of hell will not overcome the church. There is a visible church, God's household which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. The church is Christ's body, Christ on behalf of his body, which is the church. It cannot be invisible. The visible church that has preserved the apostolic tradition from the apostles in its purity. God has preserved the church because Christ promised. He said the gates of hell would not prevail. Christ himself is the head of the church. The church is his body. The church is a pillar and foundation of of the truth. It is a visible church. Protestantism is really poisonous fruit from a poisonous truth that that Western Christianity evolved into. You know, with atonement, you know, Protestant denominations focus so much on Christ's death and resurrection as paying a blood price for our sin, rather than the mending of a broken relationship between God and man through free cho choice. In orthodoxy, we have theosis. And with original guilt, inheriting the Western legalism and trying to break faith into a science, making it so black and white. And you get something like predestination and Calvinism, the idea that people are doomed to hell from their birth or before. It doesn't reconcile well with a free and merciful God. We need tradition and the true church should have bishops. The Bible says teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter, oral tradition is important. In the binding and loosing power of the bishops, it is in the New and Old Testament. There should be a continuity between the Old and New Testament and what the church looks like today. In the sacraments, how many Protestant denominations have all of the sacraments, like anointing the sick? Anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. The sacrament of confession, Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, 
their sins are forgiven. We need to go to a priest, our bishop, someone with apostolic succession, someone that had the hands laid on them. We need to see a continuity between the old, the new, and the current church. God gave us these sacraments. God gave us the sacraments like confession so we could have our sins forgiven. In the Eucharist, this is a huge point when you compare the modern Protestant contemporary worship to the historic liturgical worship and how the apostles worship, you know, with the Eucharist. And so nothing happens to the bread. There's no magical change. There's no mystical change in the bread. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, the body and blood of the Lord. It is not just a symbol. There is a real presence in the Eucharist. That is the focus of the liturgy, is the Eucharist, is a sacrifice. The Old Testament goes into detail about how the Israelites worship, serve at the altar, and partake of the offerings of the altar. The early Christians worshiped in the similar way to the Jewish worship because they inherited from the apostles. Again, the continuity, the historicity of how we worship. The early church wasn't a bunch of free-spirited charismatic. They were liturgical and they had a priesthood. Again, in the Old and the New Testament, there is a priesthood. Who who received the priesthood? New Testament Christians worship liturgically as their fathers did before them. They observed the hours of mega churches pop up in the prosperity gospel. You know, Joel Osteen being like, I am prosperous. I am successful. Read the story of Job. Job was a faithful servant to God. It does not guarantee a good life. The prosperity gospel is morally bankrupt and it is wrong. And most Protestant services are just pep rally music, you know, focusing on our individual interactions with God. It's like a TED talk about Jesus with a concert. It's not how the apostles worship. We look at the New Testament. We look at the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the liturgical practices of having the lamb in the altar for a sacrifice. The priesthood in the Old and New Testament versus just this versus Pastor Bill coming up and giving just some random speech and then giving you a glass of grape juice and a cracker. It's not reverent. The Eucharist is the center of liturgical worship. It is our medicine. Jesus is very clear. It is his body and blood and we need it. And sola scriptura by scripture alone. If, if all you need is a Bible, why do Protestants write so many books about doctrine and Christian life and what the Bible actually says? If the Bible itself were sufficient for one to understand, why don't Protestants just simply hand out the Bible? Shouldn't it just be obvious? Why don't, doesn't it produce consistent results? Why don't Protestants all believe the same thing? What is the purpose of a Protestant study Bible? Of all you need is a Bible. Why hand out other things to help us understand the Bible? Why do you need to teach or preach at all? The Bible should just be so obvious. Protestants know deep down that the Bible cannot be understood alone. So why, if the Bible is sufficient, apart from holy tradition, can a Baptist, a Jehovah's Witness, a Charismatic, a Methodist, all claim that they believe what the Bible says, yet no two of them can agree on what the Bible says. Obviously, it is not obvious, and you need to rely on other sources like holy tradition and history. Nowhere in the Bible does it suggest the Bible alone is a sole source of correct information. They talk about oral tradition, they talk about history. Nowhere in the Bible does it even suggest that the Bible alone is a sole source of correct information. And what does the Bible say from removing books from the Bible? Any man shall take away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the books of life. Now, what did Martin Luther, the reformer, do? He removed seven books of the Bible. So scripture is infallible. We just need scripture. But you can remove seven books from scripture. He has no authority to do this. Same Martin Luther that said, be a sinner and sin boldly. But faith without works is dead. Faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Not everyone who says, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. You can lose salvation if you willfully sin over and over again without confession. And once saved, always saved, it indicates that you have to do good things to be saved and shouldn't be evil. But if you are and completely neglect the faith, well, then you just were never saved in the first place. It doesn't make any sense. How do you know which one is more true than the other? The Lutherans versus the Anglicans? versus the Calvinists, versus their branches, you know, Presbyterians, the Baptists, Pentecostals. How do you know who is right? I mean, which one? I could go through and debunk each branch. There's literally so many. But a lot of them kept the same Catholic presuppositions. But the thing is, unlike the Catholics, they have no continuity with the early church. Most of them have no priesthood. They have a symbolic Eucharist. Again, there's like 30,000 denominations or whatever. They're not united. They're not Catholic. And they're not a church. Here's just one example. The Anglicans. Because this guy, an uh, English king, wanted a divorce. And, you know, I'll make a separate video about, you know, the Catholic system of annulment. But look at this. 
all these annulments. He wanted a divorce. So he just started his own church. I don't want to join a church that was started because an English king wanted a divorce. I don't think that's a valid reason. And also look at the modern Anglican church. It is completely modernist. It has a woman priesthood. This is what happens when you try and reinvent the wheel. You know, when you say the church is erred, you're denying Pentecost and the Holy Spirit and Christ's promise that the gates of hell would not prevail. There would never be a century long blackout. It allows for literally anyone to step in and say, actually, we are the true church. You have to look at the early church and tradition from which a Bible is a derivative of. Protestants try to just look at the blueprints of how a church should look and try and create that. But when you need to look at history, you can't try and reinvent the wheel. They should have walked backwards on the path and looked at history, but instead they tried to create a new path. This meme sums it up. Instead, they continue down their path and cause endless fracturing. They have no basis to judge each other because they're all operating on the same assumptions. They have no grounding basis. I mean, what makes the Mormons more valid than the Baptists or the Methodists more valid than the Lutherans? You need to be grounded in something. I mean, Sola Scriptura and getting back to the basics, it sounds great on paper. It, you know, it's a big hit. Everyone totally agrees. You know, we just needed scripture all the time. Something like Mormonism, what makes it any more or less true than any Protestant denomination? It was started in the early 19th century. It does not accept the Trinitarian doctrine of Nicene Christianity. Christianity. I mean, they had the same presuppositions that the church fell away. This is the revival of the true church. When you say the church is erred and it's been invisible, it allows for literally anyone to step in and say, actually, we're the true church, like Joseph Smith. And again, what makes it any more or less true than any Protestant denomination? In modern Protestant churches are extremely modernists. They have no historic authenticity. I mean, what's stopping a new pastor from starting up a new strip mall church? There's no hands laid upon. Do you have any saints? Are there any Protestant saints making up worship as you go? In contrast to the liturgical worship, the priesthood, the sacraments, and apostolic succession of the historical church. Orthodox have the liturgical worship, priesthood, sacraments, and apostolic succession. Protestants do not. The true church was how the early church was. It was one holy, apostolic, sacramental, universal, liturgical, priestly, hierarchical, historic, sacrificial. It made the study of patristics. It relied on holy tradition. It did not teach sola scriptura or sole fide. It was the visible body of Christ. So there's only two options that have all these, Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. The East and West were united for over a thousand years, but because of Rome's ever-growing papal claims, using forgeries, adding the filioque way to the creed, attempting to excommunicate the patriarch of Constantinople, and all these innovations, it caused the schism. The West caused the schism. And the Roman Catholic Church is in schism, and their schism has led to more schisms, like the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. Because the Protestants rebelled against all these Catholic innovations, the Protestants should have looked at history. Instead, the fracturing just compounds immensely. Rome is completely modernist now. I have a whole bunch of videos debunking Roman Catholicism. Some people will say, well, what Orthodox? Well, and then they'll just give this big list. But the thing is that these are all very small, dying, withered branches. And the difference is, is that they are actually really similar to other forms of orthodoxy versus the Protestant denominations versus the Protestant denominations, which are radically different in what they believe in how they worship, you know, Methodist versus Baptist, Lutheran versus Presbyterian. They are all so radically different versus even though there are all these schisms and these are dying withered branches they still agree on a lot versus the protestant denominations are radically different oriental orthodox have incorrect christology they didn't they reject some of the ecumenical councils so even though they are very similar eastern orthodoxy is the answer because it is christianity in its original pre-medieval form without doctrinal change or alteration without all these innovations it's orthodox but not jewish it's catholic but not Roman. It's evangelical, but not Protestant. It's not denominational. It's pre-denominational. It's not ancient. It's not modern. It is eternal. If Christianity is true, Eastern Orthodoxy is your safest bet because we have an ancient liturgy. We have all the church fathers and tradition. Orthodox know their Bible. We have the saints. We have a continuity with the early church. We haven't added all these innovations like the Roman Catholic system. We embrace the mysticism and gray areas of our faith. We have the sacraments. We have the Eucharist. We have a reverent liturgy. You need the Eucharist. It is the medicine that is going to save us. You need to join the visible 
church. The church is the ark, and the gates of hell will not prevail. God bless. All will ultimately be saved. And resonated with me as I was coming out of my uh, American, I call it a American CrossFit religion, you know, just that syncretism. I take a little bit of that. I take a little bit of this. Uh, I could probably even fairly call it New Age.